Hello and welcome to your last ever research methods lesson. We're going to finish off with chi-squared and reporting investigations. So as always, just have your pen and paper ready. Your starter is looking at a Wilcoxon test. So read the questions and just answer A and B. It shouldn't take too long as it's only a one mark question and a three mark question. With question A, it tells you in the scenario whether it's directional or non-directional. So all you have to say is one or the other. And then for the other, for B, consider that it's not asking you to report a conclusion. It's just asking you whether the result is significant. So what you need to do is talk about the calculated value and the critical value and say whether it's significant or not and then why. So one mark for saying that it was directional, it was a one-tailed hypothesis because it told us the direction that the results were going to go in. It told us that memory would be worse if people were on a restricted diet. And then for B, you get one mark if you said that the result was significant and then two further marks for explain, explaining this. So the calculated value of T was 53, which was worked out for you. And this is less than the value of 60, which was the critical value. The number of participants was 20 and the significance level was P is less than or equal to 0 0.05 for a one-tailed test. Therefore, the result was significant. Um, remember the, the role of R. So Wilcoxon doesn't have an R in it. Therefore, the calculated value has to be less than or equal to the critical value, which it is because 53 is less than 60. Last lesson, I asked you to do this apply your knowledge question. So go grab it if you don't have it handy. And we're going to go through the answer now. So A asked you to identify a suitable test. Out of the two that we did, we did um, Spearman's row and Pearson's R. You wanted to say that we're going to use Spearman's row because Pearson's R is only used when we're testing interrated reliability, which in this scenario, we are not. Another reason for using Spearman's row is because we're testing an association. So we want to see if there's a relationship or a correlation between age and GCSE. So as your age increases, does your GCSE grade increase as well? And the level of measurement is ordinal because with because even though age could be seen as interval because it has fixed intervals, um, GCSE grades cannot be seen as interval data. It's ordinal data because the differences between getting a 6 and a 7 at GCSE is dependent on the, the test. Um, so it's not the same difference... Um, from getting say a three and a four to what the difference is between getting a seven and an eight so therefore it's ordinal data because all we can do is rank it from person who got the best GCSE results to person who got the worst and then b it asked you um what calculated value would be significant at two percent level so you needed to look at 15 because the number of participants was 15 then because it was significant levels of two and it was a non-directional hypothesis, you had to be looking at this number here. So 0 0.521, that's the critical value. So therefore the calculated value had to be equal to or greater than 0 0.521 to give a significant result because Spearman's row has an R in it. Therefore the calculated value has to be greater than the critical value. So chi-squared is a little bit of a weird one because as you can see from the Simon Cowell table, it can be used when we're testing for difference or when we're testing for an association between two covariables. It's one of the very few tests that deals with nominal data. So for each category that we count up, um, we place the number of people or items in that category into a table. Um, it, we can't order it. And it's not interval data. We only deal with nominal data. And if we're testing for a difference, then the data has to be independent. Um, in other words, 
no personal item can appear in more than one of the cells. The investigation we're going to look at today is taken from a real study by Gilligan and Antonucci and they found that women were more likely to make moral decisions based on an ethic of care and may, men made decisions based on an ethic of justice. So moral decisions, anything to do with right or wrong, women cared more about um, maybe other people's feelings and emotions, whereas men just um, based their moral decisions on what was fair and what was right. So step one in a chi-squared, as with all the other statistical tests, is to state the hypotheses. So this is a little bit different to what we've looked at previously, because you have to state the hypothesis um, for a test of difference, and you have to um, state it for a test of association, and then also state the null hypothesis. In this case, just to make things simpler, we're going to state a non-directional hypothesis. So it's just going to tell us that there is going to be a difference um, but it's not going to tell us which way it's going to go. So have a go at writing those three hypotheses for me. Firstly, for the association hypothesis, you should have written, there is an association or correlation or relationship between gender and the kind of moral decisions made. For the difference, fairly similar, there is a difference between men and women in terms of the basis for making moral decisions. And the null hypothesis would, would say there is no association or difference between men and women in terms of the basis for making moral decisions. In terms of this study, why are we using a chi-squared test? Well, it's a test of association. It's also a test of difference. And it uses an um, unrelated design because it's an independent group's design. Uh, men and women couldn't... Um, we can't do a repeated measure design because the two groups are men and women. And the data are nominal because every person belongs to one of the four categories. So you're either female with an ethic of care, female with an ethic of justice, male with an ethic of care, or male with an ethic of justice. So therefore, we're doing a chi-squared test. Step one, which you had practice with in the previous um, exam question that I set is to, um, sometimes you'll be asked to draw a contingency table, sometimes it'll be done for you. But have a look at this contingency table. It's usually a two by two. Um, so you can see female and male, and then ethic of justice and ethic of care. And all they have done is they've tallied the number of people um, that fit into each cell. So five females, um, had an ethic of justice when making moral decisions, 10 females had an ethic of care, 12 males had an ethic of justice, and 9 males had an ethic of care. And then all they've done is they've um, given you the totals for ethic of justice, ethic of care, um, total number of females, total number of males, and then 36 is the total number of all participants. And then what we do is we find the calculated value. Now, this is probably just from looking at it, the most complicated one to test the calc to um, gain the calculated value from. But I'm going to break it up for you and hopefully you will understand. So firstly, look, you can see that each cell has been labeled A, B, C and D. And this is represented here. So let's start with cell A and find out where they've got these numbers from. So all you do for cell A, which is this one here, is you look at the total number of people that put ethic of justice and then you put uh, you find how many females and then you just times these two numbers together. So 17 times 15 and you divide it by 36 because that's the total number of participants. Once you've got this value, this is your expected frequency value, and it's 7.08 in this case. And what you want to do is you want to subtract that from the observed value, which is five. That's the observed value is what we actually found when we did our study. So five minus 7.08 is minus 2.08, but in this column here, 
we ignore all signs. So even if you get a minus number when you do your sum, you just ignore it and it would only be 2.08, um, which means that you can subtract the observed value and expected frequency value any way you want because it will always give you the same result. Once you've got this value of 2.08, you square it to get 4.3264. And all we do here is we divide this 4.3264 by the original expected value of 7.08. And this gives us a value of 0.6110. Okay, let's go again for cell B. So cell B is here. So again, total number of ethic of justice is 17. The total number of males this time is 21. And then we still divide it by 36, which is the total number of participants. And this gives us a expected frequency value of 9.92. Again, we take this value and we subtract it from our observed value from self B. And again, it gives us 2.08. We square it. And then we divide it by our original expected frequency value, 9.92. Cell C, same thing. 19, we've got from the total a number of ethic of care. And 21, oh, sorry, 15, we've got from total number of females. So 19 times 15 divided by total number of participants gives us 7.92 minus 79.2 from our observed value in cell C, which is 10, that gives us 2.08. Square it and then divide it by the expected frequency value, 7.92, to get this result. Finally, cell D, we're looking again here, total uh, number for ethic of care, times total number of males, which is 21, divided by 36, gives us 11.08 minus 11.08 from our observed value of 9 here, which gives us again 2.08. Square it and then divide it by the expected frequency, 11.08, and it gives us 0 0.3905. And all we've done here is we've added all of these up together. So this is our chi-squared value. This is our calculated value. You'll never be expected to remember how chi-squared is tested, but you might get asked to input some of the numbers. So using the contingency table, these observed values, for example, might be blank and all you would have to do is input the observed values. Um, or maybe this section might be blank and all you'd have to do would be to square these. Or this section would be blank, um, but you'd always get given the formulas here. So you'd always know what you were looking for. So then, as always, we look at the critical values table. But with chi-squared, we look at degrees of freedom instead of n values. Our degrees of freedom for this study is the number of rows, which if you think back to the contingency table, um, there were two rows, ethic of justice, ethic of care, and there were two columns male and female. So number of rows was two, minus one is one, times number of columns, which was two, minus one, which is again one. So then we just times one by one, and we get one. So our degrees of freedom is here. The kind of hypothesis was two-tailed because it was non-directional. We only said that there would be an association or a difference. We didn't say um, which way it would go and the significance level is 0 0.05 so therefore we're looking at this critical value here finally we have to state our conclusion so as a reminder our calculated value chi-squared was 1.984 our critical value was 3.84 Chi-squared has an R in it, so the calcul calculated value has to be greater than or equal to the critical value. Is 1.984 equal to or greater than 
3.84? No, it is not. Therefore, we have actually not found significant results. So then we would report it as, as the calculated value, 1.984, is not significant at p is less than or equal to 0.05, we must accept our null hypothesis and conclude that there is no association between men and women in terms of the basis for making moral decisions. So now we move on to reporting investigations. And to start with, I know you haven't um, yet done this, but I just want you to try and guess which key term matches which description. Just have a good go and then we'll go through the answers. So firstly, our references section includes details of articles or books mentioned in the article. So we have to let the reader know where we have got our information from. From Then we have our method, which is a detailed description of what we did or the researcher did. Then we have our results. And this includes details of what the research found, including any inferential statistics that we did. Then we have our introduction, which is just a review of previous relevant research. Our discussion is um, our interpretation of the results found. So what, what is the conclusion? What are the implications of it? Are there any practical applications, etc.? And then finally, we have our abstract which includes a summary of the study, including all of the sections apart from your references section. And the order that they go in is, one, we, look, we have our abstract, then we go into our introduction, we then talk about our methods, then what we found, then we discuss what we found, and then we reference. So not only is it so important to understand reporting investigations, because any research that we've looked at, any study has been written up in this way that I'm going to explain now. And you can access so many of these online um, and they're always organised in the same way. In summer, you will have to do a research project and write me a scientific report. Um, obviously, we'll have refresher lessons before then, but it's really important to get a basis of understanding now on how you're going to write it. And it's also really, really useful for those of you who are thinking about university as you'll have to write millions of reports during university and they'll follow the same, um, the same order as I'm going to explain now. So firstly, we have our abstract. This is a summary of the study. So we look at the aims, the hypotheses, the method that we used, the results, the conclusions, um, including any implications of the current study, so what it could mean to the wider population. These are usually about 150 to 200 words. Um, sometimes they're a little bit longer. And it's just really useful so that the reader just gets a really good idea of um, what the study and the results were. And you'll read millions of abstracts if you're thinking about university, um, when you're doing literature reviews, etc., just to um, make sure that before you read the whole journal article that the study is actually showing what you want it to show. And then we move on to our introduction and this bit just reviews all of the previous research that's been done so far. So for example, if you um, wanted to do a research project on the capacity of short-term memory, your introduction would talk about Miller's magic number and it would talk about Jacob's digit span test. But then you would have to um, then really state your rationale, your reasons why you're carrying out your study based on this research. So are there gaps in knowledge? Maybe the research that you've stated only looked at male participants, maybe you want to see how females react in certain ways. You just need to identify the gaps in the research and why you're carrying out your study. What's the reason for it? And the introduction should be written like a funnel. So it starts very broadly speaking about a theory or a concept and then you narrow it down to your particular research hypothesis, what you're actually investigating. And in the introduction, you state your aims, your research prediction and your hypotheses. Then you talk about your method. 
And this needs to be really, really detailed because if someone reads your journal, your um, research project, you want it, uh, you want them to be able to replicate it just based on what you've written. So it needs to be um, very in detail. So firstly, you talk about your design. So was it repeated? Was it independent? Was it much pairs? What kind of experiment was it? Was it a lab experiment? Was it a covert observation? And then you you state why. So why did you use that kind of experiment? Participants, how did you sample your participants? Was it volunteer? Was it opportunity, etc.? And how many participants took part? So their age, their job, um, anything else that's relevant, like their gender, um, socioeconomic status, if that's relevant to your study as well. Then you need a clear description of what materials you used. So if you're testing short term memory um, using pictures or words, then you would need a clear description of these words um, and maybe include any pictures as well that you used. Procedures is a very important part of the method. You need to include standardised instructions um, because if someone was to replicate your study, they would have to do it in the same way in order to get reliable results. And finally, you talk about ethics. Um, so any significant ethical issues that may, ar may arise, how you've dealt with those. So did you give participants informed consent? Did you debrief them? Um, was there any potential risk for psychological or physical harm? And then we state our results. Um, so what did we find? So we might use descriptive statistics, we might use tables and graphs and um, dispersion, measures of central tendency, etc. And we also do our inferential statistics. So which statistical test did we use to analyse our data? Um, we include calculated values, critical values, significance levels, etc. Um, and we state whether our results were significant at this stage as well. If it's qualitative research, then categories and themes are described along with examples of these categories. So you might have done a thematic analysis or a content analysis. And in that case, you would have to describe the categories and the themes. Our, after our results, what we have to do is um, interpret these results. What does that mean? If you find a significant difference in um, short term memory capacity between males and females, what does that mean? What are the implications for future research of this? And what are the real life applications? So firstly, we summarise the research um, and give an explanation about what the results have shown. And then we relate it back to the previous research that we've mentioned. So does this, does what we've just studied um, relate to Miller or um, Jacobs in any way? Does it contradict their findings? Does it support their findings? And then we really focus on criticising our own methodology. So what could have improved? And you might look at ways of improving your validity, your reliability of the study, um, and then suggest any improvements that could be made. Uh, maybe there were some demand characteristics, maybe there was a bit of social desirability bias. So we consider all of these things and think of ways to improve them for further research. We then look at the implications for psychological theory and possible real world applications. So if you found that men have a much um, smaller capacity for um, short term memory, then our real world applications might be to get men some help or some uh, memory techniques in order to help help them increase their capacity. And then we suggest um, future research. So what do we want to do um, from what we found? What could we test next? Then our final section is um, our references. So this is a full details of any journal articles or books that are mentioned and examiners love asking um, you um, to write a reference. And I'm going to um, give you a bit of a practice in a sec. So the format changes depending on the type of source. So with a journal, you put the author's name, the date, the title of the article, the journal article, volume, issue number, and the page number. Whereas with a book, you put the author's name, the date, title of a book, place of publication, publisher. If the references section is not completed properly and the researchers are not mentioned when due, it's called plagiarism and it's a big issue in universities and they will check your references. 
very thoroughly. So a little example here and a small flex because this is my research project. Um, you have, because this is a journal, you have the researchers names first, the author's names, then you have the date 2018, you have the title of the article and then you have the journal title, so what um, what journal it was included in, the volume and the issue number, and then the page number as well. And I want you to have a go at writing a reference for a book. So, in 1993, a book about gender was published in New Haven. The book was written by Sandra L. Bem from Cornell University. The title was The Lenses of Gender, Transforming the Debate on Sexual Inequality, and the book was published by Yale University Press. A researcher needs to modify the above information to include Bem's book in the references section of a scientific report. So your task is to write a full reference for this book as it should appear in the reference section of the researcher's report. Just as a little reminder, you should have the author's names. So you start with the surname, comma, first name, dot, middle name, just the initials for the first and the middle name. Then you have the date, the title of the book, the place of publication and the publisher, which is all in the information above. So have a go at writing that. So you should have written BEM, comma, SL. You need to include the first and the middle initial if they have one. Then the date, the title of the book, um, the place of publication and who published it. You only get one mark um, for a reference that contains at least a surname, date and title in reference format. Uh, but you need, um, you need to write this bit word for word if you want the two marks. So that is everything for today's lesson. As always, please upload your notes onto Teams and let me know if you have any questions.